I want to encourage you to take out your Bible in the New Testament, be turning to John chapter 16. We are jumping ahead, as it were. Uh, obviously, we will come to this passage on our Sunday morning series in probably a year and a half or so. Uh, maybe a little bit less than that, but uh, nevertheless... Uh, we, uh, we will have more to say about it at that time in its context. Tonight I want to not entirely isolate verse 33, but largely isolate verse 33 and think with you for a few minutes this evening about the implications of it. This is a, a familiar passage, I'm sure, to virtually everyone here. And in fact, it has a, been a memory verse for many of God's people over the years. I don't expect that I'll say anything tonight to you that will be truly new. But I hope that God will use this passage to impress upon all of our minds truths that we need to be mindful of. John chapter 16 and verse 33, Jesus speaking says this, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. This verse appears at the end of the Upper Room Discourse. John chapters 13, 14, 15, and 16 contain that discourse. And particularly, chapters 14, 15, and 16 are a single teaching unit where Jesus is uh, speaking to His disciples immediately prior to His betrayal in the garden, His arrest, and then ultimately the next day His crucifixion. And in chapters 14, 15, and 16, Jesus has a lot to say about the coming of the Holy Spirit and about the persecution that is coming upon the church. He is going away, and yet He says, it is to your advantage that I go away. If I do not go away, I cannot send the Comforter, the Helper to you, but if I go, I will send Him. And He, in coming, will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and the judgment to come. He will bring to your mind all that I have said to you. He will teach you all things. The church is blessed to have Jesus Christ sitting enthroned as King at the Father's right hand and to have the Holy Spirit present among us in this age. If we back up just a little bit to get the immediate context, we might read beginning in verse 25 of the chapter these words. Jesus said, I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. And that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered each to his own home and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone. For the Father is with me. And then our text, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. It strikes me that when Jesus says, I have spoken to you in figures of speech, but the time is coming when I will no longer use figures of speech. It strikes me that Jesus is speaking of the presence of the Holy Spirit with the church. That the things that the disciples have heard but not properly understood will become clear when the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples on the day of Pentecost and begin opening their understanding more fully to the Scriptures. Jesus Himself will begin to do that in Luke chapter 24 when after the resurrection He opens their minds that they might understand the Scriptures. It may be a bit presumptuous and premature for the disciples in this passage to say, Ah, now we understand you. Now we get it. Now we know. And Jesus says, in fact, the hour has come when you all will desert me. And it's in that context that Jesus says, I have spoken these things to you that in me you may have peace. This passage I want to unpack with you for just a few minutes, and I want to make a few observations about the original text. Not because I want to get 
bogged down in any kind of tedious details about Greek, but because this is actually a fairly simple construction, and there are some features of the underlying text that are somewhat obscured in the ESV that I think it might be to your advantage to know. Let's just walk through the verse real quickly. These things I have spoken to you all. Jesus uses a verb form here in describing His speech that is in the perfect tense. And the the significance of the perfect tense in the New Testament is it speaks of a past event that creates a new condition, a new state, as it were. In other words, whatever was done in the past continues to have implications in the present. Now, I want you to think about that for just a second. What's Jesus talking about? Is he talking about the words that he has just spoken in the verses immediately prior? Well, there is certainly a connection with that immediate context that we just mentioned. Is he speaking about the upper room discourse as a whole? I think undoubtedly these three chapters are so tightly woven that really we do a, a disservice to the text if we break it up into chapters. We need to simply treat it as a single unit. It's a package deal. These things I have spoken to you and the words that Jesus has spoken in this upper room discourse will remain with the church and continue to bless the church for generations to come. But the use of the perfect here suggests that Jesus may even be looking farther back than just this immediate conversation that they're having. And what I want to suggest to you tonight is that there are at least two levels at which you can think about this statement. That you can say, yes, there is a sense in which the immediate context is in Jesus' mind. I have spoken these things to you here and now, and by virtue of these promises, I have created a new state in which you will enjoy peace in me even when I am not personally present with you. What is it that enables the church to have peace in Christ? It's the presence of the Holy Spirit. And it is His coming that is the primary burden of these three chapters here at this point in the Gospel of John. There is a very real sense in which what Jesus says about the coming of the Holy Spirit to the church is that which makes possible the church's peace We have peace in Christ as we walk in the midst of this world because the Holy Spirit is with us. Just as Jesus says in verse 32, the hour has come when you will all depart, you will forsake me, and yet I'm not alone. The Father is with me. Jesus cannot truly be abandoned because the Father is with him. And in a similar way, When the circumstances that Jesus has described just recently in chapters 15 and 16, when those circumstances come upon the church and they are put out of the synagogues, and when people think that they are doing service to God by hating and persecuting and pursuing even to the death these followers of Jesus Christ, even in that hour, the disciples will not be alone. Why? Because Jesus Himself will be with them. But Jesus is going away. Jesus left the Father, came into the world. Now He's leaving the world, going back to the Father. Jesus won't be with us, but we will have peace in Him. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is with us. The Holy Spirit dwells in our hearts. And the Lord is the Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit's presence with us is representatively the presence of Christ. The Spirit is the agent of Christ's presence in the church even today. And so there is a very real sense in which the things that Jesus has just spoken, the words that have just come out of his mouth, are the basis of this peace that he's describing. But I want to pull the lens back a little bit further, and I think the use of the perfect tense allows this, to recognize that Jesus has not only spoken these words in the upper room discourse that his disciples might have peace, but every word that has come out of his mouth since he came into this world was spoken toward that end. Isn't it a beautiful picture that we have in Matthew chapter 5 when Jesus comes up on the mountain and his disciples gather to him and he is seated like a rabbi and Jesus opened his mouth. Have you ever noticed how Matthew draws attention to that? You say, what's the significance of that? Everyone opens their mouth to speak, right? Yeah, but there was something beautiful about Jesus opening his mouth and out of his mouth flow these words of grace. This message of truth. And that is characteristic of Jesus' ministry from beginning to end. These things I have spoken to you for the last three or three and a half years, however long that ministry may have been. These things I have spoken to you. And then notice that the text says, that in me, in the ESV, that in me, 
you may have peace. But the Greek is even a stronger, clearer construction here. This is a henna clause that often is used in the New Testament to indicate purpose. What is the purpose of Jesus' speech to his disciples? It is in order that in me you might have peace. Toward this end, Jesus' word is given to the church to the end that the church will enjoy peace in Christ. Now, I want you to just think about that for a second. What is it that we neglect so early and so often when we are experiencing trouble in this world? Now, maybe this is not your experience. Maybe your experience is exactly the opposite of what I'm about to describe. But I know that in my life and in the lives of many people that I have counseled over the years of ministry, uh, the first thing that begins to be neglected is the word of God. It's the word of Christ. It is now I am under pressure. I feel in the grip of a vise. I am worried. I am stressed. I cannot focus on Scripture. And I quickly begin neglecting the reading of Scripture, the meditation upon Scripture. And yet, what does Jesus say in this passage? The words that I have spoken to you. When? All of the words that I've spoken to you. That I have in the past spoken to you. These were spoken to you to the end that... You might enjoy peace. Part of the means of grace that we're about to start unpacking on Sunday nights in our catechism reading is the word of God. And particularly, not only the reading, but the preaching of the word of God is made an effectual means of grace by the spirit. And isn't that interesting how that's where Jesus goes? He says, as you as you enter into a period of your lives where I will not be physically present with you, as you enter into a period of your lives that is going to be characterized by persecution and for most, if not every one of these men, their lives are going to end violently because of the very circumstances that Jesus is describing. And yet he says, I have spoken my word to you. I have given you my word so that you might have peace. And it's even stronger than that. In the Greek text of the New Testament, there are a couple of ways to convey emphasis. You know, we don't have the audio recordings of, the, of Jesus speaking to his disciples. And so you can't tell where his voice changed in its pitch or inflection or something of that nature. You don't have bold-faced font in the original Greek manuscripts. You don't have underlining or an exclamation point. There's nothing like that in the manuscript. And so by virtue of the very construction of the sentences... The New Testament writers can suggest where the emphasis belongs. English uses word order to establish uh, grammatical function, right? We, we put the subject before the verb and the direct object after the verb and things of that nature. Word order is very important in English. If you change the word order, you change the meaning of the sentence. Not so in Greek. Greek is a highly inflected language. In other words, the form of the word and the endings of the word convey what purpose a given word serves in a given sentence. And the beautiful thing about inflected languages is you can shuffle those words all different ways around to convey certain ideas. One of the ways that Greek conveys emphasis is by fronting the sentence with a word, moving a word up to the beginning of a sentence in order to show its importance in relation to the rest. But when it comes to pronouns, when it comes to pronouns, there is a special way in which the pronoun can be written. And that special emphatic form of the pronoun is used by Jesus at this point of the sentence. And this is fascinating to me because Jesus isn't writing this down, right? Jesus is having a verbal conversation. But John, in the spirit, is remembering this conversation. And what does he recall? He recalls Jesus saying, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. No, that's not what he remembers. I don't know exactly how Jesus said it. I don't know what prompts John to write the pronoun in this form other than the influence of the Holy Spirit. But whether it was the tone of Jesus' voice or whatever other way the Lord may have conveyed this, what what Jesus literally says in this text is that in order in me... Me, myself, peace you may have. That's what he says. It's an especially emphatic form. 
Jesus wants us to understand that the peace that we have is in Him. It's not in anyone else. It's not in anything else. You don't have peace in any of the things in this world. You have peace in Christ. Now, if we were writing this originally in English, what we would probably do is we would put that pronoun in me, we put it in bold font. Or we might underline it. Or we might put it all in capital letters. But those options were not available to the New Testament writers, so they took advantage of one of the conventions of the language of their day, and they wrote the emphatic form. Because the emphasis in this statement is on Christ. Jesus does not say that you and I can have peace in the midst of problems. He says you and I can have peace in Christ. And only in Christ. Because let's face it, there is no way to be at peace in many of the circumstances that we encounter unless it is peace in Jesus Christ. These men were going to suffer terrifically for the Lord, even as Christians since then and even to the present day have and do. There are things that you and I are going to encounter that are going to be frightening, that are going to be painful, that are going to be devastating, and there's going to be no way that we can look at those circumstances and find any peace at all. But Jesus says, in me, in me, you can have peace. That's important. And if you are a person who underlines in your Bible, that pronoun needs to be underlined. And then he goes on. In the world, trouble, tribulation, you are having. Interestingly here, he uses a verb in the present active indicative form. Now, most commentators, and the ESV follows this idea, will say, well, it's a present active form, but it has a futuristic sense. Well, Greek can do that. And so we don't want to rule out that possibility here. You'll notice in the ESV, they translate this as a future tense verb. I I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. As if the idea is one day. Well, if in fact Jesus is speaking only of the persecutions that he's been predicting in chapters 15 and 16, then that's the appropriate way to read that verb. But what's fascinating to me is that it's a present tense verb in the original language, which suggests that it's happening right now. And it will continue to be characteristic of the disciples' lives unto the end of their lives. It's not just that at some future point, see if Jesus had used a future tense verb here, we might think he has a particular suffering in mind. The fact that he uses a present tense verb suggests that he has in mind the suffering that is continual in this world. And what form does that take? We should not confuse physical sickness with persecution. You know, I mean, if you have to have your gallbladder removed, don't talk about how much you're suffering for Jesus because technically that's not suffering for Jesus. But let me tell you something. Sickness and all kinds of suffering in this world receive new color and a new context when you're a believer in Jesus Christ. There's a difference between a person persecuting you for your faith in Christ and falling into some kind of physical illness. But the Christian glorifies Christ in suffering no matter the origin or context. And I think this is why it's important and this is why I would not translate it as a future. Is because Jesus is not saying, you can have peace in me at that future point when the persecution comes. Oh, certainly you can then. But his point is larger than that. You have peace in me throughout the experience of suffering in this world. Right now, in whatever way you're suffering, some of you are hurting right now as you're sitting there. Pain is continually with you. In this world, you are having tribulation. But in Christ you have peace. Some of you are being persecuted. Maybe there is someone who has taken a position against you. They're opposing you. They're speaking evil of you. They hate you because you are a believer. You are experiencing persecution and tribulation right now. But in Christ you have peace. And that is true today. It was true on that day when Jesus spoke it. It will be true until the end. That's the important part of that present tense verb. Is that this does not locate this peace 
solely in the context of persecution. Because even though having your gallbladder removed is not persecution, you can still have peace in the midst of it. If you have that peace in Christ. That makes this promise, I think, even more profound and helpful to the church. But be of good courage. Be of good cheer. Take heart. And the next verb in your text is an imperative. And it's the only place that this particular verb is found in the New Testament in the imperative form. The imperative form is the form of command. This is not a suggestion. This is not a gentle admonition. This is not Jesus coming and saying, don't don't worry, it's okay. It's possible for you to be encouraged at this point. It's a command. A command to take heart. A command to be of good courage. A command to look at this promise of the Lord and be strengthened by it. Take heart. I have overcome the world. And here the perfect recurs. The perfect tense that points back to something that happened in the past and creates a new condition that has implications in the present. Now here's the fascinating part. At this point, Jesus has not yet died on the cross. Jesus, technically speaking, cannot say, I have conquered the world. Because that's going to happen the next day. He's going to conquer sin and death on that cross. He's going to come out of the tomb the third day. Sin and death are defeated. The power of sin and death are broken. Jesus has overcome. But Jesus uses the perfect tense the night before it all happens. Because you know what? In the mind of God, in the purpose of God in Christ, this is as good as done. Jesus' victory on Calvary creates a new state for the church in the world. In the world, you are having tribulation and you will continue to have tribulation. If you think that Jesus came and gave His life in order to change that, you misunderstand The real purpose that Jesus has in going to the cross for us. He didn't come in order to change the trouble that we have in this world. He came to transform that trouble. And to transform our experience of it. You are having and will continue to have trouble in this world. But he says, in me, you have peace. In me, you have peace. Why? How is that possible? Because I have overcome The world. He has already conquered sin and conquered death and put an end to that which creates all of the problems for us so that now we're able to look at our suffering in an entirely new way. I can look at sickness in a different way because Christ has conquered the world. I can look at the hatred and opposition of my friends and neighbors in a new way. Because Christ has conquered sin and death. I can look at my own death in a new way. Because Christ has overcome. The world cannot win the contest that it finds itself in. The devil has no options left for victory. In fact, in Revelation chapter 12, when we see the casting out of Satan from heaven... The Lord speaking through an angel speaks to the fact that the devil has come having great wrath, knowing that his time is short. The most dangerous soldier on the battlefield is the one who knows he's not going to go home. Because now he has nothing to lose. I don't know what's in the devil's mind prior to the resurrection. But what appears to be in his mind is some thought that some way, somehow, his purpose might prevail. And that the death of Christ is working toward his own advantage. That's why he puts it in Judas' heart to betray Jesus. But since the resurrection, Satan is under no illusions about the outcome of this struggle. He knows that Christ has won. And you and I need to know that as well. I don't know every individual circumstance, but I know enough about enough of you. And about my own experience in life. To know that whether at this present hour or in a day that is near, 
Every one of us are going to experience pain. We're going to experience disappointment. We're going to experience trouble. We're going to experience fear. We're going to experience worry. And this is a passage that needs to anchor our thinking. Not just in that moment, but especially in that moment. You and I don't know what lies ahead for our lives, except to know that in the world we will have trouble, and we do have trouble. But that's not all we know. See, we need to be realistic about the world in which we live. If we think as the word of faith charlatans and false teachers would want people of God to think, if we think that Jesus came so that I can have my best life now, we're in for profound disappointment. That's that's an attractive message. All of us naturally would want to believe that's the case. But here Jesus is saying it's not the case. In the world you are having, you have tribulation. And you will continue to do so. But take heart. In me, you have peace. And it's a peace that transcends the sufferings of our present time, no matter how great those sufferings may be. You've got to realize that without becoming reckless and without becoming arrogant, you and I ought to recognize that we are largely, by the grace of God, bulletproof. What is the devil going to do to you? He can hurt you. He can hurt you physically. He can wreck your life emotionally. He can put you through such extraordinary anguish that any normal person apart from the grace of God would be crushed by it. And there is nothing that He can do to you ultimately because you are God's and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Isn't that amazing? There's no scenario in which you lose this battle because Christ already overcame. And therefore you can have a peace that transcends your circumstances. A peace, a joy, a sense of purpose in the midst of the worst experience of your life. I've prayed in enough nursing homes and hospital rooms and next to enough hospice beds that I have many different ways that I have seen people suffer that I personally would like to avoid. There are certain ways I just don't want to die. The reality is, in every one of those cases, if that person is a believer, they are empowered by the present Holy Spirit that this promise might be fulfilled in their lives so that even in that moment... They have peace. And it's not a peace that is tied in any way to their material circumstances. I can't can't pray with you and say, I know that God will relieve your pain. I can't pray with you and say, I know prophetically with insight that God will heal your cancer. I can't sit next to you and pray with you and say, I know that God will relieve this anguish of heart that you feel. The reality is, He may not. I know that He can. But God may say no. Do you remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when Paul pleads with the Lord three times to remove this thorn in his flesh? We don't know for sure what that thorn was. I tend to think that it's an impaired vision. I think there's evidence of that in both Galatians and the book of Acts. But regardless of what it is, it's something that troubles Paul so greatly that he would beg God three times to take it away. And the Lord tells his faithful servant, Paul, no. No. No, because that thorn is serving God's purpose in Paul's life. But do you remember what the text says in verse 7 about the origin of that thorn? It was a messenger of Satan sent to buffet Paul. And God says it's fulfilling my purpose in your life. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I can't know by reading the tea leaves of providence what God is doing in my life at any given point in time. But I know this, I can look back over my life and I can see ways that God has allowed me to suffer for my own spiritual good. I see things in my past that at the time of their occurrence were miserable and awful and wretched and that drew me closer to God. And I thank God for that suffering. 
You and I in the midst of the struggle are not necessarily going to understand how God is using this for good. What we ought to be absolutely confident of is that He is, that He does, and that He will. And we can have peace in Christ because He's already overcome the world. And so on the day where the doctor says, I have bad news, on the day when our body experiences great pain and the doctor says there is no relief, on the day when our best friend dies, on the day when our finances fail, on the day when we face a future that is bleak and daunting and there is no hope for improvement in it at all, on that day, the people of God have peace. And what does Jesus say? He commands us. To take heart. He doesn't recommend it. He commands it. He says you look at what I have said to you. You look at my word. And you find in me, myself, and nothing else. The peace that you can have nowhere else and in no other way. That is a profound and powerful promise. These things I have said to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you are having trouble. But take courage, because I have overcome the world. Let's bow and let's pray. Heavenly Father, man is of few days, and those days are full of trouble. It was true in Job's life in a particularly bitter and brutal way, but it's true in all of our lives. We recognize, Father, that every person will experience struggle, and in particular ways, your, peer, your people will suffer because of their trust in you in the midst of a world that hates you. And yet, Father, tonight we are encouraged by the promise, the precious promise of your Son. For the word that he has spoken, that in him we might have peace. And for the victory that he has won over the world where our trouble is to be found. We long for the day, Father, when you will call us out of this present evil world and pour out your judgment upon it. We long for the new heavens and the new earth where righteousness dwells, where nothing unclean will ever enter, where there is no more sorrow, where there is no more tears, where there is no more pain and no more death. We long for that day when we can be glorified with our Savior, Jesus Christ, and can see His face and can praise the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, forever. Lord Jesus, we pray that you would indeed come. And until that day, Father, we pray that by your Spirit, you would strengthen our hearts and help us to be obedient to your Son's word, that we might take courage and find peace in him. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.